All right, we're going to go through Acts 4 today, and uh, if you didn't notice uh, the theme of this chapter in Acts 4 is boldness, boldness. So this chapter showcases the boldness of the apostles, which I think is very interesting. We can learn some lessons uh, from the story here in Acts. How can we be more bold in our lives? How can we be more bold to stand for the Bible? So uh, let's go through it. So I've divided it into four sections. So the first thing we see in Acts 4 is we see Peter's boldness. Peter's boldness. So let's start from verse 1. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, uh, for it was now eventide, albeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. See, people, you know, start to fear people that are, you know, a messenger or starting to have significant influence. So you can see there that they are starting to influence a lot of people. The number of the men was about 5,000. That's how many people that they're influencing in terms of believing the things that they are teaching. So now the authorities are starting to get worried, right? So they get arrested, you know, they lay hands on them, put them in hold unto the next day. You can see the people that are coming, you know, the, these rulers and the, and the priests, the captain, and the Sadducees came upon them. And it says here, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Now, if you don't know who the Sadducees are, the Sadducees were a sect amongst the, lead, the religious leaders there that denied the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So they were the ones that came to Jesus in Matthew 22. It says here, the same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection. Right, so that's why they're taking issue with this preaching. Because remember, in um, remember what happened in Acts three, where they healed that person, and then they were starting to preach to people that Jesus rose from the dead. He was that prophet that Moses spoke of. He would raise a prophet like unto me. So they are preaching now the resurrection of Jesus Christ. A lot of people are believing them and believing the things that they're saying. The Sadducees are upset. Why? Because they specifically deny that there is. A resurrection. So they try and trip Jesus up here in Matthew 22, verse 24, saying, Master, Moses said, if a man die, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third unto the seventh. So they come up with this hypothetical to say, okay, well, if, if a man marries a lady, and then he dies, and his brother marries her because there's an obligation in the law of Moses to marry your brother's wife and raise up seed to her. And then he dies, and then the third one comes along and then marries her, and he dies, and another one comes along, and it's like just this crazy hypothetical, right, that they're coming up with. To, but to make a point, right, they're trying to say, well, if this happens seven times, right, so likewise the second also, and the third, unto the seventh, right, so it's like there's seven brothers marrying the same woman. But they all die because none of them, you know, none of them have children with her, but they, 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 and they all pass away. And last of all, finally, the woman died also. Right? <laughs> Therefore, so why are they bringing up this, this issue? They're trying to trip up Jesus with, when it comes to the resurrection. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. So what they're saying is, so in the resurrection... And all eight of them are resurrected again. Who's husband and wife? You know, is, he, she, is she the first one the husband, the second one the husband, the third one, or the seventh one the husband? So they're trying to raise this to show, well, therefore, the resurrection can't happen because how can we have this situation where there's seven people or all the husband of this one woman? Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. So this is similar to, you know, like when we go out soul winning and people have a misconception about Christianity, um, you know, that's, they, they, they call that a straw man argument. 
a straw man argument is when you say your opponent, you know, believes something that they don't actually, and then you, you know, uh, basically object or, or argue against that argument, which is not a position they hold, it's one that you've raised, and then you think you've won the argument. That's what they call a straw man argument, because you're raising a straw man, you know, hitting the straw man, and then thinking you've hit the actual person, right? So here, the straw man is that, well, when you're resurrected, that you're still married. So this is where Jesus corrects them. But it's touching the resurrection of the dead. Have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. See, so the first thing Jesus does is he corrects them about their belief about the resurrection, that people remain married in the resurrection, which is not the case. He says they are neither married nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. And then he says, he says that in verse 31 onwards, he's telling the Sadducees, no, there is a resurrection, and he's referring to them to Old Testament scriptures, saying God is not a God of the dead, but of the living. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he's saying, if there's no resurrection, then who is God ruling over? He's not a God of the dead. So you see how that, that's where that statement ties in. You're always wondering why Jesus said that. So he's saying, God is a God of not of the dead, but he's a God of the living. And if he's the God of the living, therefore a resurrection happens. Now the resurrection is critical to the Christian faith because in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul tells us that if Jesus did not rise if, if there is no resurrection from the dead, then Jesus didn't rise from the dead. And if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then what hope do we have believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and therefore our hope is vain? So the Sadducees are actually believing and teaching a very critical, uh, a teaching against a very critical belief. And you must believe in the resurrection of the dead because if you don't, then you can't believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, which is, you know, one thing obviously they're disputing and they don't like Peter preaching. 1 Corinthians 15. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? So you can see there in the Corinthian church that this leaven of the Sadducees was starting to creep in here, just like the, you know, I guess the leaven maybe of the, uh, maybe of the Pharisees that believed you had to be circumcised to be saved was creeping into the Galatian church. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith also vain? Right? And later on he goes on to say that you're still in your sins if Jesus Christ did not raise from the dead. So let's continue. Acts 4. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. So you wonder, you know, it, it, it tells us here that they gathered all these ruler, rulers and elders and religious leaders to basically interrogate the apostles. And maybe to in part that it's an intimidation tactic as well. That you come and you gather them all together. That it's a bit more intimidating when they have to testify before a number of people rather than just in private to one or two. So they've got them in hold. They gather all these uh, elders and rulers and, and religious leaders and then set the apostles in the midst, which is John and Peter. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost. So you can see that when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, it results in boldness. But see, what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Ghost? You know, sometimes people just think being filled with the Holy Ghost is just this, this emotional thing that just comes over you and you, you know, it's not even of your own will that you have this boldness. But see, we understand what is the Holy Ghost in the physical realm, right? Like the way we interact with it. It's the Word of God. So there is a practical way you can know whether you are filled with the Holy Ghost. The question is, are you filled with the Word of God? You know, that's why I don't think it's just some naturalistic explanation, you know. 
Whereas I believe, you know, when you are filled with God's word, when you know God's word, it leads to boldness. In the same way, when they were filled with the Holy Ghost, they had boldness as well. So I think there is that practical side of it, where, you know, you just fill yourself with the Holy Ghost, with the word of God, it will lead to boldness. I do think as well there's also a supernatural side as well. So there may be a, an element of both here. But you can know whether you're filled with the Holy Ghost, and you can know, and, and, and that will give you boldness to preach the Word of God, like Peter is here. See, he's, they're set in the midst. They're trying to be intimidated by the religious leaders here. And yet, how do they view this? They view this as an opportunity to preach the Word of God with boldness. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what mean he is made known, he is made whole. He's saying to them, oh wow, well if you're arresting us and bringing us here, because remember they didn't know why they were being arrested at first, because they were, they were preaching, the Sadducees were upset, took them away, but then when they were coming to be interrogated, they didn't know what they were going to be interrogated about. But Peter says here, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole? So it's like, hey, well, if you are arresting us and want to know, you know, and, and inquiring about what power, by which, by what power we heal this impotent man, verse 10, they say it with boldness. They see it as an opportunity to preach the word of God. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you hold. This is the stone which, which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, but whereby we must be saved. So they clearly preach the gospel, saying Jesus Christ is the only way I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And, they, and he even says to them, hey, whom ye crucified, you fulfilled this Old Testament scripture, the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. So what is he quoting there? He's quoting Psalm 118, 21 you know, to 22. I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me, and art become my salvation. The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvellous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So I, I like putting this verse in the context of what it's referring to in Psalm 118, which is you know, that Jesus Christ rose again. You know, he was rejected of the builders, whom the builders refused and has become the headstone of the corner. So that's a, res a reference to the resurrection. And this is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I know oftentimes Christians use that verse for people's birthdays, you know, and, and it's a nice verse to use for people's birthdays. Like, hey, this is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it, the day that somebody's born. But the real meaning of this verse is it's referring to uh, the resurrection. Now, this moment in Acts, and it's one of many, you know, one of, well, one of uh, you know, many in the Bible where people are brought before rulers to testify and state their view and they preach the gospel with boldness uh, to these people. Jesus mentioned this to the apostles when he was still walking with them, that this time would come. And you see it happen in Acts chapter 4. Look what Jesus said to them in Matthew 10. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. So Jesus told them of this time that that would come. And Acts 4 is when it's starting to happen with the apostles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. 
For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. He also warns them in Luke 12, verse 8. Also I say unto you, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. So this is referring to rewards. We know um, this context based on other pas passages in Scripture, not necessarily your salvation. Verse 10, And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. And when they bring you unto the synagogues and unto magistrates and powers, taking no thought how or what thing ye shall answer or what ye shall say, for the Holy Ghost shall teach you in that same hour what ye ought to say. So we see there in Acts 4, Peter's boldness and Jesus' pre-warning of this time that they would have to stand before governors. And he tried to comfort them, saying, hey, don't worry about what you have to say in that day. The Holy Ghost is going to speak through you and give you words to speak at that same hour what ye ought to say. Let's go on to the second section in Acts chapter 4. How to have boldness. Now we can see from this story some practical application for ourselves. How to have boldness. Acts 4.13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and we see that, that when they are brought before the governors and the rulers, that you know, that may, be, that may have been a time for them to hide and cower down. But no, they use that as an opportunity to be bold. And they're going to earn rewards from it as well. You know, that's why when Jesus says in, in Matthew 10, when you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. That's denying rewards, right? But they have the opportunity because of the persecution to earn these rewards, right? Verse 13, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. So the first thing we want to talk about with how to have boldness, and I kind of alluded to it, is knowing your Bible creates confidence, right? It creates boldness. See, they spent time with Jesus physically. But you can spend time with Jesus spiritually. See, when you spend time in the Word of God, you are spending time with Jesus. So sometimes people are not bold in their witness. They're not bold when they testify of the things of God. Right? When you're preaching, either preaching the gospel or even if you're just defending the things of God. You lack the boldness because you haven't spent enough time with Jesus. See, if you spend more time with Jesus, you spend more time in your word, in the word, and you know the Bible in and out. When you testify and you're an ambassador, you're a witness for Jesus, you'll be more bold about it, just like we see here with the apostles. See, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, See, that's the same when the world might think of you and say, well, you're not some Bible scholar, you know, you're not some theologian, but you can know the Word of God, right? And you can speak the Word of God with boldness. See, they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. See, they were just common men, right? They weren't some respected leaders in their day either. That's sort of what they're saying. They marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. What does that mean? That they knew what they were talking about. And the fact that, you know, in those early days, miracles were being done too, they could not speak against it. So reading and studying the word is time spent with Jesus. Verse 15, but when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, what shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem. See, if you know what you're talking about, and you know how to argue and debate with the Word of God using that sword of the Spirit, right, which is the Word of God, then people will not be able to, to fault your logic, right? Not be able to fault your, your rationale, not be able to fault the arguments. Just like here, they can't speak against what they're saying. They know what the Old Testament says, but they just don't want to believe it. So what, what, do, what 
tactics do they resort to now? See, when evil people can't win an argument, they attempt to silence you. And this is what they're trying to do here too. Saying, what shall we do to these men? For indeed a notable miracle has been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it, for that it spread no further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them, that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. So it kind of reminds me of like the online censorship that happens. You, know, they, you, know, you better remove that post. You know, a lot of people lose their Facebook accounts and lose their Twitter accounts, things like that. That's just evil people, you know, threatening them. You know, don't, you know, don't speak against the COVID vaccines. Don't speak against the lockdowns. You know, we're going to ban you on social media. We're going to take away your voice. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. So it's not easy to be bold in the face of persecution, like we see them here, that they're threatening them. I mean, they were imprisoned because of the things that they were preaching. But be encouraged that it's an opportunity to earn rewards. Acts 4.19. Now how do Peter and John respond? Well, they respond in a way that you would hope that they respond and that we can take example from and be encouraged by it. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. So they're saying that you wouldn't even believe, because these guys are meant to be the religious leaders, you wouldn't even say to hearken unto man more than unto God. So judge you, who should, who should we listen to? Should we listen and serve God, or should we serve man? For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people, for all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was about 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was shown. So this section we're talking about here, how to have boldness. First way you have boldness is to know what you're talking about, right? And part of knowing what you're talking about, you know, this is why soul winning is so important, guys. You know, you guys have to start going soul winning. Make sure you're soul winning regularly. Because it's not just about knowing, you know, you say, oh yeah, I, I heard Victor preach on that topic, now I'm ready. No, because you know, if you don't share and teach the things that you know, you know what? You forget it, right? And that's why many of you knew a lot and you would have retained it when you were going out and preaching the gospel. But now you try and preach the gospel and you're like, oh, you know, I've forgotten the verses, forgotten how to explain it. It's because if you're not a doer of the work, you become a forgetful hearer, right? So part of becoming bold in your faith is you need practice, you know, and that's why soul winning is important too, that if you're not practicing, preaching the gospel, handling objections, how to explain things, you're going to get that opportunity with your loved one, with your colleague, and you're going to be like, oh, maybe I won't talk about it this time because I don't really know what I'm talking about. What a shame. You know, what a shame that you, you know, you know how many of us, you know, you want people to get saved, you want that opportunity to come up where somebody says, you know what, hey, explain to me what you mean by being a Christian. What is this thing I heard about? You know, like, isn't that the opportunity that we all wait for? The, the Philippian jailer moment that where somebody gets down on their knees and says, what must I do to be saved? And what, what do you want your reaction to be? Oh, I know I didn't memorize the verses. I didn't memorize the first 10 verses of the Kids Bible Cup, Cup Challenge. You know, you didn't put in the work. You didn't put in the memorization. You didn't, get to, you didn't spend time with Jesus in the word, and out on the highways and hedges, and when the time came to be bold, you choked. Do you want that to be the case in your life, when you have an opportunity to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, I don't. So we need to know what we're talking about. We need to be bold, which means we need to put what we know into practice. We need to teach it, and if we're not practicing, we're going to be out of practice. Right? That's why soul winning is important. It's not just about getting the word out, it's a, it's a training ground too, so that we grow in our works and in our effectiveness. Now what's the other factor we see here, how to have boldness? Is that we fear what God thinks 
more than what man thinks. You know, sometimes when you spend too much time in the world and amongst worldly people, you start to care more about what they think, more than what God thinks. You know, and that's another downside to not being in the Word, not being in the work with Jesus Christ, is that, you, like I said, you start to prioritize things of the world rather than the things of God. You start to care more about what the world thinks more than what God thinks, right? And it's the same here. Why were they so bold here to respond to the religious leaders? Because they feared God more than they feared man. Matthew 10, 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Right, so we should have a reverent fear of God. Here it's talking specifically about why people should believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Have a fear of God of what God can do to you eternally. But as children of God, we should fear how God can chastise us. You know, and have that reverence towards God that we care more about what God thinks more than about what man thinks. And we have that mindset. Then that will help us to be more bold. Look at what Paul says here, Galatians 1.10. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. All right, so we want in our lives to serve God. If we serve God, we know what we're talking about. You know, we're, we're in good, you know, good practice. You know, pray for boldness. That's how we get bold. So that's what goes on to my next point. Praying for boldness. Acts 4.23. So now they have, you know, we see Peter's boldness out preaching the gospel. They get arrested for it. They're brought before the religious leaders. They tried to threaten them, tried to use intimidation tactics. They feared God more than man. They knew what they were talking about. They preached the word of God with boldness. And they couldn't hold anything against them. And they can only threaten them. Now they let go. They went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. See, this is, what, this is what's so important about church. You know, church is where we gather with like-minded believers. And we see here after they are tried uh, and they go through a bit of persecution, it's always encouraging that they have a home to go back to. Right? So being let go, they went to their own company. So part of being bold as well is, is we're not just on our own. You know, that's why it's important that, you know, we, we here as a family, we know one. We're all trying to be bold. We're all trying to preach the gospel, but we have somewhere to come back to. And that's why the relationships in church are so important. You don't want, you know, sour relationships in church. You want to love one another here and care for one another because, you know, when we go out and fight against the world, you don't want to come to church and also get beat up as well. Right? Church is where you can refresh, you can recover, where you're amongst friends here. You don't want to be amongst foe. And it's the same here. They, the, the apostles go out preaching the gospel. They're getting enough persecution out there. You don't want to come back to church amongst like-minded believers, especially, you know, the minority of the minority of the minority, like we are, and also be at adversity with one another. Right? We want to provoke each other unto love and good works, be an encouragement. And like here, you want to be able to go back to your own company and be prayed for, be supported, be encouraged, you know, be, be provoked to do more. Report it all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. So you see how they go back and they give them an update. Hey, this is what has happened, you know. And that's what church should be about. Hebrews 10, 24, let us consider one another to provoke and to love and to good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. You know, that's a, it's another important thing about, you know, going out there preaching the gospel, having that greater common purpose. You know, churches that lose that common enemy, that common purpose, start to infight. And that happens in, in any organization, when they lose the vision of what they're meant to be about. You know, this is why soul winners often don't, are often very close and good friends. 
you know, and they, they tend to not fight not once, amongst one another. Why? Because they have that common purpose. They have a greater enemy that they're fighting against, that they can put their differences aside. And they're encouraged because they're in that battle together, as opposed to battling one another. Acts 4, verse 24. So they come back, they tell their company what happened, and when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David hath said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast appoint, anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. So what are they saying? They came back, they told them what happened, and they look to the Bible knowing that this was expected. They're encouraged in the word of God knowing, hey, God already told us about this. Because what are they quoting? They're quoting Psalm 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. So it's interesting that they use Psalm 2. Psalm 2, you would think, was talking about, you know, rulers of the world, like coming to war against Christ. But how they're actually referring to this psalm is in Acts 4, where the rulers and the Pharisees and the religious leaders are waging this spiritual war on the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so they come back, tell them what happens, they encourage themselves in the word of God that this was expected, that they knew that persecutions would come to them. So that's another way that we can be bold, is that we shouldn't be surprised when persecution comes our way, like we're shocked, like I can't believe this happened. No, the Bible tells us that persecution will come our way if we are bold for the Lord Jesus. 2 Timothy 3.10 But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. But out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. See, so we should expect persecution just like the apostles expected persecution based on Psalm chapter 2. Acts 4 verse 29. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. See, so what was their response after they came back? They recognized that they would become under persecution. They prayed for boldness to continue to preach the Word of God. Isn't that an amazing thing? You know, that they came back to get encouragement. They're praying for boldness. Not to, not to be able to hide. You see, like sometimes Christians be like, you know, like uh, when it comes to persecution, oh, you know, like what are we going to do? How are we going to hide? You know, how are we going to just like, you know, get off the radar and go off grid so that we can just live at peace and just, you know, grow our vegetables and be self-sustaining, you know? And, and, and learn how to can things. No, it's they prayed for boldness. How could they be more bold to speak the word with boldness? By stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. They say, hey, help us to speak with boldness and help us to do great things for you. That's what their response to persecution was. Not how do we hide and how do we disappear and how do we just make sure nobody knows that we're around. No, they want to be, have more of an impact in the society they're living in. 
And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. Right? So God answered their prayer. Ephesians 6.18, here's Paul asking to be bold. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication with all saints. And for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So they prayed for boldness, and God gave them boldness, because if we ask for things according to God's will, he hears us. That's what the Bible tells us. They asked for something according to God's will. He heard them and granted their petition. First John 5, this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. So boldness. We saw Peter's boldness. Talked about how to have boldness. Praying for boldness. You know, having a church together to be bold with one another. You know, praying for boldness. And the last one we see in the chapter is we want to support boldness. Support boldness. And that's what I think the last part of the chapter shows. We talked a bit about it in terms of the church, you know, being there for one another. Acts 4, and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. So you see where you have that common, that unity, you know, you tend to not fight one another, but you want to achieve that one purpose, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Neither said any of them that that ought neither neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own. See, so because there was that unity and that common purpose, it wasn't life wasn't just about the person anymore. You know, people saw themselves as a cog, as a contributor to a greater purpose. So it's like, hey, the things that I have are not for just me. They're for pushing the cause of the Lord Jesus. But they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them. So you see here, my last point is, is supporting boldness. And what do I mean by that? I mean by the people of the church, the people of God contributing to help those that are being bold continue to do that. That's why the, the apostles were not expected to go out and work because it was those that did work supported them to go out and preach. And that's what we see here in Acts chapter 4. So you see, they were willing to give of their possessions and verse 33, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and grace, great grace was upon them. So the people going out, being bold, being that spokesperson, being that, that ambassador for Jesus Christ ought to be supported by the people in church. So that's what we see here. 1 Corinthians 9, 7. Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? You know, so sometimes people are critical of, you know, preachers getting paid, church workers getting paid, and things like that. But what I want you to understand is, and I'm not just saying this for my own benefit, is that's the right way it should work. You know, the people that are putting themselves out there you know, and speaking the truth and, and, and being the public face ought to be supported by the people that aren't. Because, you know, oftentimes people that put their face out there, you know, their, their employment opportunities can be shot after that. You know, once you're on Google, you're on YouTube and things like that, you can't always go back to the private sector, right? And it's the same here in 1 Corinthians 9, 7. 1 Corinthians 9 is a chapter about believers giving, supporting those that are in the ministry. It says here, who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? So you can see there that analogy of the soldier going into battle. 
You don't expect the soldier, you know, if they're in Vietnam, they're in Iraq, they're going and fighting that battle to also be trying to make a living while they're there, right? Paying for their, you know, supplies, paying for their weapons, paying for their own food. No, the expectation is that those who are not embroiled in that spiritual war are the ones that are meant to support those that go to war, right? And that's why I think in this chapter, it's all really tied together about being bold, how to be bold, but also supporting those that are going out there and being bold as well. And then when you do, everyone benefits, right? Because if the, think about in the early church. If the apostles all had to work and hold full-time jobs, who's going out and standing before the religious leaders and before the councils speaking the truth, right? So that's why they need to be supported. And when they are, look at the ministry grow. 2 Corinthians 9, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. So this is not talking about like the prosperity gospel of today, where you give $100, your business is going to make $10,000. You know? And if you give $1,000, your business is going to make $100,000. Or, you know, you give $1,000, you're going to get that next promotion where you get a $10,000 raise. You know, put your hand on the screen and give now and God's going to bless you. This is saying, if you sow to the ministry, you can help the ministry become more fruitful. Why? Because it frees up those that are going out and doing that ministry, going out, being that public face, speaking, you know, to people and all that. It allows, frees them up to do that work and therefore the ministry is more fruitful. This is what this is talking about. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you. You see that? And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. So you think there, you know, people that if you give to a ministry, that ministry flourishes, you also benefit from the flourishing of that ministry. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So you see there how it all works together, where the ones that are being bold go out and preach, right? The ones that are not so publicly facing support, but because of the support, there's the, the ministry flourishes, and then that comes back on your own as well, that if the ministry is flourishing, the seeds that you sow are also more effective. So it all works together, and that's um, what we're seeing here. Let's finish off, Acts 4.34. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. So again, this is not socialism. This is voluntarily contributing to a common cause. And then that, those, those resources are then distributed to help support those that are fighting for that common cause. So we see the love from the church that supported the apostles here. And, you know, I would hope that our church has that same love. You know, and one day our church may be supporting multiple people, right? But you need to think, you know, that's how the ministry grows. That's one way it grows. And you have to support those that are out there preaching the gospel. I'm not saying it's just me. Other people as well. You may know other people that are bold. And sometimes, you know, people try and negatively talk of them and say that, you know, that they're grifters. Yeah, it's easy for people to say those things when they're not the ones putting their name and their face out there. Right? But if you appreciate the people that are putting their name and their face out there, we ought to be like the, the early church. Right? I mean, look how generous they were. I mean, look, they, they, they were selling lands and houses and contributing it to the early church in order to be able to run that ministry. So we see the love from the early church that supported the apostles. 
And the thing is, that's why sometimes persecution is good. You know, persecution brings unity. It makes people more generous, right? So that's why even under persecution, sometimes there's a silver lining to give to an important cause, and for this is the gospel. But the selflessness increased the fruitfulness of their work, right? Now, Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So, in this chapter, Acts documents the sacrifice made by such people as Barnabas, um, you know, who we see as a, he is a close companion of Paul. If you know that Paul went on his journeys, you know, Barnabas traveled with him for the first half. Later on, they had a bit of a divide, and then Paul went with Silas, and Barnabas took uh, Mark. So, I think the point being made here is, or one thing I get from this, is. You know, in this life, people are only concerned about the legacy they leave in the eyes of men. And they will strive their whole life to build up lands and houses and possessions because they want to leave an inheritance for this world. Or maybe for egotistical reasons, you know, they want to leave a name for themselves. Maybe they build a business and what, what is left behind. And some people who only care about what happens in this life, that's how they view immortality. I don't know if you've ever heard them say that. How will I be immortal? Well, it's because I will live in the minds of people forever. It's the legacy I leave in this world. But my question to you today, are you only concerned about your legacy in the eyes of men? Ask yourself the question, what will be your legacy in the eyes of God? So you may think, well, you know, that's, that's, that's pretty crazy, selling a house and giving it to that ministry. But look, it was, it was documented in the book of Acts. It's like for all eternity, <laughs> that act of Barnabas was recorded and commended to say, look at what this man did. The son of consolation, a Levi, the country of Cyprus, he having land, didn't just keep it for himself and think about his own earthly possessions. He sold it and in a time of need brought the money, laid it at the apostles' feet. So what legacy will you leave in the eyes of God as opposed to the eyes of men? Right, so in conclusion, you know, have boldness. You know, be with Jesus. Know the word. Fear God, not man. Please God, not man. Second one is pray for boldness. Surround yourself with bold people. That's why it's so important that you know this church is close and we love one another because maybe one day the time will come where persecution is even greater and we need to be able to come back here to pray for one another and comfort one another and provoke each other unto love and good works like they did there. They didn't pray to hide. They prayed for more boldness. So we encourage one another and we need to expect persecution. And the last one is you want to support boldness. You know, strive for unity in the church so that we can support and encourage one another here. You know, be generous in your giving so that those that are out there preaching the gospel, taking that stand, are supported by the church, right? And they can spend more time doing that and then make sure you make an impact in the world, right? Because you also support it by you being bold yourself. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this, uh, this lesson from the book of Acts. We thank you for the example, not just from the apostles, Peter and John, as they boldly preached your word in the face of persecution, but we also thank you, Lord, for the example set by the early church, that they were encouraged by the boldness, that they prayed for boldness, and, Lord, that they supported boldness. So, Lord, help us to be a church like we see in the, in the book of Acts, and, uh, Lord, give us the grace and give us the boldness that 
we know you want us to have. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.